In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, then God said, Let there be light. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. The traditional and joyful Easter greeting is Christ is risen. Christ will rise. <laughs> Indeed. So let's do it. I'll do it right this time too. So, <laughs> so let's really do it. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Indeed. 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 <laughs> 
in your pews, there are these cards or under your chairs, there are these cards that we are using now instead of our attendance pads to let us know that you're here, to give us any updated information that you might want to give us. And then on the back, there's a place for a prayer request or a comment or a question. So you can um, fill those out, stick those in the offering plates when they come by, and we will be happy to respond to them. We will be starting a new sermon series next week based on this book, Church of the Wild, by Victoria Lors. And we'll be studying this book and um, doing it from next week through Pentecost, which is May 19th. You can get a copy for yourself uh, online or at your local favorite bookstore. We have some limited copies out on the counter as you leave. You're welcome to take one of those. We are asking for $15. And if by any chance that is a problem for anyone, just talk to me and we will make sure that you get a book. No problem at all. In addition to the sermon series, then on Wednesday evenings, the evening disciples class will gather from 6 to 7 to practice Lectio Terra, which is a sacred contemplative reading practice meant to draw us into deeper connection and a deeper relationship with the earth. Class participants will meet at 6 in the gathering space and then proceed outside, weather permitting. And if you have any kind of questions about that, you can talk to Pastor Liz, who will be leading that. Paying it forward. This Sunday, as well as last Sunday, some of our singing was from African American spirituals. So we're asking that you consider donating um, and putting gospel choir um, on the memo part of your check if you wish to be part of paying royalties forward to support the sustenance of the music, its creators, because unlike most church musicians and lyricists and composers, they were never paid, nor have they been honored by name. So these funds will support the McCaskey Gospel Choir as we pay it forward. Rising with Power, our Easter offering supports Grandview's primary partner in addressing racism, which is Power Interfaith. We have an opportunity not to just give dollars, but we can give our time and our talents this coming month. On April 18th at 4 in the afternoon, there's a countywide Justice for Education rally at McCaskey High School. So you can join other Grandview folk who will be participating as we encourage the legislature to fully and fairly fund education and overcome years of racially biased funding. For all of our announcements, there's a QR code on the front of your bulletin. If you get the weekly e-alert, um, announcements are in there. If you don't, you could sign up on this pew card. Um, and certainly on the website, all of our announcements are there. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
Ooh, I was just transported. <clears throat> These are words from Zora Neale Hurston. She's quoted in Cole Arthur Riley's book, Black Liturgies, which we've been reading throughout Lent. So listen to Hurston's words now. Of course he wasn't dead. He could never be dead until she herself had finished feeling and thinking. The kiss of his memory made pictures of love and light against the wall. Here was peace. She pulled in her horizon like a great fishnet, pulled it from around the waist of the world and draped it over her shoulder. So much of life in its meshes. She called in her soul to come and see. her horizon like a fishnet, tossed it over her shoulder. Today we conclude where Cole Arthur Riley concludes, liberation, but I was also drawn back during this week to one of her early chapters on place. Isn't it something she observes that in Genesis, God makes a home for things before God makes a thing? Three years ago, we, Grandview, left our home in the United Methodist Church after it ceased to offer shelter. Living there threatened to kill the good news we had been given here at 888 Pleasure Road, one of God's homes in the world. Staying there in a house where discrimination was codified and blessed threatened to compromise our ability to share good news among all the people we were called to share it with. We were chained entombed. We needed to be loosed and liberated in order to keep being and doing what God wanted us to do. So we found our collective voice and we built something new. The third anniversary of that uprising is tomorrow. Now, 
Back before Christmas and Advent, we considered the four gospel homes and we built houses to match each message. This got me thinking, what is the Easter house of Jesus? Is it an empty tomb? Is it the whole world? This space, full to the rafters with our voices, surely Jesus is alive in many, many places. Soon, God willing, we'll start a new congregation in York with people who had to move out of their former place and who had begun planting roots here and are now facing the dread of uprooting themselves again in order with great hope to build the foundations of a new gospel home in York County where their lives are rooted. Simone Weil said, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. As we build a new home, how could that space be redolent with resurrection faith, with faith that creates resurrections, faith that helps people overcome? Cole Arthur Riley reminds us that the places our bodies are matter. Those who suffer dislocating anxiety often reground themselves by using their body's five senses. What's one thing you smell? What are two things you hear? What does our own gospel about resurrection look like, sound like, taste like? How do we experience Easter bodily? Maybe it smells like pungent lilies and hyacinths or looks like showy daffodils and bending tulips. Can you hear what it feels like to open a plastic egg? Such a lovely symbol of the grave opening up. Maybe for you, Easter's the taste of red beet eggs or ham, or maybe it's avocado toast, the stone rolled away. Maybe resurrection tastes like a fizzy cava sangria, bubbles rising. Maybe it feels like a frilly, itchy dress, or gloves and hats, or suits with pastel bow ties, or maybe it's bunny slippers and comfort wear, or an outfit that shows off your latest tattoo, like our friend Leanne Allen's colorful ones. Or is it something more? A time when you came back to life after something devastating. Or that moment when you realized you had fallen in love or found a true friend. Or is it a time when we overcame actually seeing justice done and peace and safety and wholeness restored, oxygen rushing back into our lungs? When we build our Advent homes, the gospel houses, one each for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most were some variation of a rectangle with a peaked roof. But John's house was different. Odd angles, floor-to-ceiling windows that let light stream in. Listen again. Early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. Early. That's how Easter begins in John's light-drenched house. It's dawn, and the sun is coming in all the windows. God is rolling back the horizon. Now there are no limits to Mary's possible. While various numbers of women are arriving at the other gospel houses today, at John's, Mary has made the journey alone. She's the I in I come to the garden alone. John's is the only gospel house where that hymn is sung. She immediately goes running back from the grave toward home. Breathless in her distress, she tells two people she bumps into, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and I don't know where they've put him. Peter and the unnamed beloved other go running, and after they see it with their eyes, they believe. But what they believe at this point is not that Jesus is alive. It's that the grave has been robbed of its body, as Mary had said. Three people are now at the tomb. She has run back with them. But then the two new arrivals leave Mary all alone again there. But fear not. She is quickly met by two others two angels who ask why she's crying. 
she repeats the message she gave to Peter and the other disciple. Someone has taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. She turns in dismay, and there he is, Jesus. She recognizes him through tears as he speaks her name. She replies, calling him by a name she frequently called him, one of affection and respect, Rabboni, teacher. The two embrace, but they don't stay too for long. He sends her out to tell many. And no longer is she speaking timidly or with fear. Now she announces. Is this the right translation of the confident, forceful verb that John chooses? With all the power of the living God now alive in her, she announces, I have seen the Lord. Let us pray. Christ is risen. Indeed, Christ is risen. As followers, however reluctant we sometimes are, however fearful we are at times, however ambivalent we may be, may we know the joy of life, of being fully alive and made new. Help us to help bring life to the lives of others. Help us to roll away the stones that have been used to stone and harm others, like racism and white Christian nationalism, like this country and the world's love of capitalism where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, like phobias of those who are different, who do not fit the easy to define binary. Fear that turns to hate, hate of others, and so often turned inward to, are related to greed and power. 
May our bodies, this here flesh of ours, be used in such ways that we together can roll back the stones of hate, of fear, of reluctance, of ambivalence. Jesus, you were healed of your pain and suffering. We ask you to ease the pain of those we love, those who grieve, those who have received devastating diagnoses, those who are hospitalized and recovering, those who may not recover. We ask that you ease pain and ease suffering. Jesus, you live. Help us in your grace and mercy to show the world that we've been changed because of your life. Help us to save this world. You rose, and now we can rise above all that separates us from one another. May we welcome all into this house, this house of love, peace, grace, gentleness. In your holy, alive, and everlasting name, amen. isn't it, how the gospel lessons for the past three weeks have all had the same funny way of counting. One, two, three, many. 
Mary goes alone, meets Jesus, and returns to announce the good news to a small cohort of followers steeped in grief and terror after the public execution of the man they expected to save them. Her story? Life has replaced death. This message heard right has done a great deal of good in the world. People who believed it not merely intellectually but with their bodies were and are a major force in establishing and protecting the voting rights of women and African Americans, protecting workers and incarcerated men, and providing peace and relief from war and disaster, and yes, in assuring that LGBTQ people and people with disabilities experience equality. All that happens in part because of people motivated by the announcement Mary Magdalene first made, the true story she told of her own experience. I have seen the Lord alive in this world. On the Moss Story Hour recently, a woman named Bridget Jones, not the fictional character, a real live woman, told her own real life story. I'm the direct descendant of enslaved Tennesseans, she begins, and I have always been passionate about honoring their sacrifice, respecting their work, and acknowledging their tribulation. My very southern grandmother, she notes, was born in Tennessee on the Ames Plantation. She kept photographs of her ancestors around her home. And as Miss Jones grew up, she was particularly interested in older relatives' conversations about periods in history when black people couldn't do this or that. That passion and that love for the place she is rooted, all of its people, led her to get a degree in African-American history with a focus on Southern race relations. So not long after she graduated from college, she and her boyfriend are driving down the road when she spots a billboard for a Bell Mead plantation. He wants nothing to do with it. Why go to our people's tomb is the gist of his very logical argument. But she insists that they go and eventually he relents and takes her there. Listening to the tour guides, she thinks, I could do this job, and I could do it better. And 10 cold emails and an interview later, she gets the job and becomes Bell Mead's first and only black tour guide. On day one, she opens the door to 20 white tourists. She, a 23-year-old in an antebellum costume with an afro, shocked is an understatement, she says. Initially, she was supposed to just tell the stories of two particular black people, but she wanted guests to think about the impact of slavery more widely. With persistence three years later, she became Belle Mead's first black director. She ditched the costume tours and began talking about all 136 people who had been enslaved on that property. It took something from that young woman, but she was raised by a mother who's a Pentecostal preacher, a descendant of Mary Magdalene, and her spiritual background gave her what she needed. On the very first day she was supposed to start the new type of tours, she had an urge to sit with spirit. So she arrived early and sat down at dawn in the clearing where the cabins of the enslaved had stood and began talking with the people who lived there. I told them I was going to need their help to tell this story, that I was going to need them to speak to me and through me. And I sat in that space for about 30 minutes, and I meditated in that presence, and I wiped tears from my eyes. Then she began her day. She walked into the kitchen house where rows of white tourists were seated. I began to break down the myth of the lost cause, she says, but what really broke the camel's back was when I told them that 11% of Bell Mead's population were half black and half white. One woman got up and left the room. She recounts how she pushed on and explained that there is this supposed idea that slavery only affects black people and I wanted to take my guests on a journey that, and explore everybody who could have possibly had a role in this type of situation. And the first person I introduced them to was Master's wife. How does it feel 
to have to look into the face of your husband's mistress every single day. Now what happens when that enslaved woman becomes pregnant and you have to look into the face of your husband's indiscretions, indiscretion every single day? How does it feel? I made sure, she says, to acknowledge the lack of control that a white woman of that time period had over her husband and his actions outside of her. But I made sure also to detail the nature of revenge that many white women took out on this enslaved woman and her children, you know, the threat of sale to alleviate her own emotional turmoil. Then Miss Jones asked, how does the enslaved woman feel? How does it feel to have to bear the brunt of someone's anger and aggression and resentment for a situation you did not ask for, nor can you control? How does it feel to have a baby by a man who only views that baby as pure property to be bought and sold at will? In actuality, not even really your baby. And just what if that slave had a husband too, she asked them. How does it feel to have to go to work six days a week, sun up to sun down, and then come home to an eight by 10 shack you share with eight to 10 people and lay down on a cot next to your wife and know that she has been and is being raped by another man, but there's nothing you can do about it. How does it feel to watch a baby come out of your wife and know who it belongs to and that there's nothing you can do about it? You can't help her. Hell, you can't even help you. So you love that child, and you love her the best way you know how. But in the midst of that loving, then what did it do to you mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually? It was like I had emotionally transcended, Ms. Jones says. Time had merged, and I could feel the weight of 136 formerly enslaved men, women, and children hovering over my Taurus and I in that kitchen house. And as I came to, out of my history-induced trance, I noticed that there was not one dry eye in the room. I had asked my visitors to feel it, By God, they felt it. I let them see me. God let people see God nailed to the cross. But he didn't stay there. God let them see the rising as well. There's an African proverb, Miss Jones says, it says that until a lion learns to write, The hunter will tell the story. In that moment, I became the lion who could write. Her mother and others in her church had often quoted Maya Angelou saying, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. I wonder if that's what Mary Magdalene felt and knew about herself. I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. I wonder if Jesus on the cross knew. I hang as one, but I hang with untold numbers who have been similarly shamed and killed. Yet I rise not as one. I rise among the infinite. We are one who are many. We are many who are one, all lions capable of writing and announcing good news. Love cannot be kept down. Still, by God, we rise. I invite you to rise as you are able to join in a prayer. Your parts will be on the screen. They're also in the bulletin. And at the conclusion of the prayer, we will join our breathing together for a breath prayer.
prayer. Um, you'll see words, and the words are in the bulletin as well, but we're not meant to say them out loud. They're meant to be meditated on as we breathe in and out. So those words are, liberation comes in a body, and I will honor mine. God who rose. If we have encountered the biblical invitation to die to self in ways that have been self-destructive, bind us up. Show us that any spirituality that ranks death over resurrection is a farce. As we taste liberation today, keep its taste in our mouths. He's Make it a joy that never ignores nor forgets the agony of Good Friday, nor dismisses the doubt of Silent Saturday. Amen. You may be seated. As Carol plays, we are invited to keep breathing together as we consider our faithful response as God's risen people. What might we offer back to God, our gifts and our very selves? After the offertory, we have another breath prayer. And so, again, nothing will be spoken, but you'll be invited to breathe on the words, God is alive and I choose solidarity. So the silence is intentional and you can breathe into it.
Let's pray. Breathing in and out with the words on the screen. Amen. If you have ever sung the Hallelujah Chorus in a choir, we would like nothing more than to have you join us as we sing it this morning. Uh, on our final hymn, following verse 2, simply come forward and Marion and Bryn will have copies of music that they'll pass out to you. Uh, if you are a tenor, if you could go along the far wall and head up the steps. If you're a bass, against this wall, uh, heading up the ramp. If you're a soprano, you can come right up in here, alto over here. I will say to the altos, be a little patient. Our brass group has a, uh, some work to do on the final hymn. So just hang out here, and then once they're finished, uh, there'll be lots of space around the, where the chairs where they're currently seated.
Kathy Riley should have the last word, and these are the very last words of her book. People think liberation is a future unfolding before us, but the path to freedom stretches out in both directions. It is what you've inherited, your first and last breath. Walk backward and graze your grandma's face. Unshackle your father from the bathroom floor. Go ahead and cry, flip the table, and then repair it in time for the feast. If it's freedom you're after, go marvel at the sky. Then look down at your own marvelous hands. Go ahead, look down at your own marvelous hands. Rest your soul body with another sacred body and tell each other the truth. Your dignity cannot be chained.